live. Okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our podcast. Podcast. <laughs> Facebook channel. This is our new Facebook uh, podcast with with audio with audio and visual. Um, we're excited to be here tonight with uh, two awesome scholars uh, to talk to us about the environment and globalization and infrastructure. Um, I'm Jelena Oxley, uh, uh, the co-founder of Grand Strand Action Together. I'm here tonight with Ashlyn Breer, who is my partner in crime. And we also are excited to have two people tonight who are experts in very complex topics and we're going to be learning from them about the Green New Deal. So I'll go ahead and introduce my friend um, Pam Martin. So I've known Pam for about, oh my goodness, 15 years. Um, this is a getting to be a long time. Um, so Pam is a professor in the Department of Politics at Coastal Carolina University. She has a specialization in um, uh, environmental and global environmental policy, uh, energy and sustainable development, and international relations and policy. She has an amazing program that she runs on campus, which has to do with the United Nations um, Center for Sustainable Development, um, and she runs that in Georgetown County. Um, she's written a number of books on fossil fuels and things like that. She knows a whole lot about solar energy in South Carolina with the solar ambassador teams, which she oversees. So I'm really excited to have her on tonight. I've been wanting to talk to her for a really long time about all these topics with Grand Strand Action Together. So uh, Pam, happy to have you here tonight. Thank and you. Ashlyn, I'm going to let you introduce your good friend. And Mal is my friend also, but Ashlyn and Mal. Ashlyn and Mal are super tight, so. <laughs> I don't think Mal needs an introduction. I feel like almost everyone watching this will probably know who he is, but Mal Hyman is a professor of sociology and political science at Coker University. He ran for Congress here in the 7th District, and he is an environmental activist and peace activist. Yes, awesome. All right, so our main questions tonight is we really just want to learn more about the Green New Deal. And this is one of those topics that you hear about and you wonder, what all does this include? So um, I asked Pam to just give us sort of an overview of the main points of the things that are in the Green New Deal. So Pam, if you wouldn't mind, just go ahead and give us a short uh, summary or highlight of the main points that are in the Green New Deal and then we'll move from there. Sure, and I don't think I need to share my screen for this. And then maybe as we get through things, I can share my screen, I've got some local data that applies to the Green New Deal that might be interesting for people. But uh, first of all, I just wanna thank you uh, both for inviting me. And um, Mal, um, I supported your campaign. So it's nice to, I feel privileged to be uh, on uh, um, this uh, show with you. So I appreciate it. So the Thanks. Green New Good Deal, well, thank you. And the Green New Deal is uh, a lot of people think it's a law or it's a bill that has passed. And it's, it's not, it's a resolution and resolutions are not legally binding. And so um, first things first, what I would call about as, as um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez calls it, it's not a resolution, it's a revolution. And she argues, and so does Senator Markey of Massachusetts with a comparable bill at the Senate, uh, in the Senate, they argue that the Green New Deal is a new way of thinking for the United States. It's a 10 year mobilization plan to essentially imbue climate change in all of the new projects that we're going to uh, build over the next 10 years to redevelop the United States. So first and foremost, I think what's important is it recognizes the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 2018 report. And that report found that climate change is undeniably human induced. And when scientists, and I, I wanna just be clear about this, it's not some belief structure. It's not, I kind of feel great about it. Um, it's not a feeling, it's a scientific data point that has what scientists call very high level of confidence. Um, so uh, over 95% secure in, in, in this data that they say that climate change is human induced. They also argue that um, this changing climate is causing, and for our area, this is really important, sea level rise, flooding. Um, Currently, we're seeing wildfires in, in the West as well, but we have been threatened on the East Coast and the upstate by wildfires. Severe storms, welcome to Tropical Storm Elsa. This is a really excellent time to be talking, or sad time to be talking about this. Droughts um, and other events that, and importantly, 
not just their impact on the environment, but that they threaten human life, human health, and our infrastructure. And they highlight in the human part that there are vulnerable communities in particular that are going to be more impacted. Um, and those vulnerable communities tend to be low income, high minority areas along the Grand Strand for the people listening tonight. Um, we know that our vulnerable communities right now are preparing for the storm and we have flooding uh, and sea level rise issues that we're facing currently. Um, the last thing is uh, that the Green New Deal really focuses on is this two degrees Celsius mark. The Intergovernmental Panel report that runs through, the Intergovernmental Panel runs through a United Nations group of climate scientists of over uh, 3,500 of them that are agreeing on this. And what they argue is we can't go above, it, usually two degrees Celsius was the tipping point, but they're saying, look at 1.5 degrees Celsius, we're out of luck people. We really need to change our course. And so um, what that means is it's gonna cause migration okay, that um, are, uh, it's gonna cause at least $500 trillion worth of economic damages, um, lost infrastructure in particular, 99% of our coral reefs will be destroyed. Um, 350 million people globally will be impacted by heat stress. And so um, if we just look at our area along the Grand Strand, I can't think of a more important topic to be thinking about and talking about what the green, uh, New Deal uh, argues is that we have to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. We need to get to net zero, so being carbon neutral by 2050. Um, and it, it argues that the way we do that will have to be through, yes, high technology capacity, but also an economic transformation of this uh, country that rebuilds and retools our economy to have uh, qualified uh, workers, especially in vulnerable communities that were maybe earning their incomes from fossil fuel based economies, they need to be retrained towards renewable energies. Um, and so essentially, it says that we're going to have these related crises because of climate change that will impact life expectancy, again, particularly um, for vulnerable communities, that uh, it will create wage stagnation for many people. Uh, it's going to erode the ability of people to get jobs uh, and to earn a sustainable income for families. Um, it combines sort of income gaps, right? Because what it says is that those who are, have to migrate, say because of sea level rise and homes along the ocean, they tend to be people who are wealthier, that their migration will be less impactful in their lives. Um, than it would be for someone who cannot afford to move. Uh, same thing with health and heat related stressors. Generally, those people who are working in intense labor industry, and of course, along the Grand Strand, we're seeing a lot of home development. So we know that that heat stress is a major factor for this industry. It's also a major industry in our area. Um, they lastly talk about the, this wealth divide in the United States that, um, 20 times more wealth of the average white family than of the black family. Um, given that South Carolina is a state that has nearly 34% of African Americans, that is an important factor. And then also the gender earnings gap that uh, women are only earning 80% of what men are. And so when we compound this, um, these problems of climate change and heat stressors and uh, issues of migration and flooding, um, we know that these economic stressors are gonna be compounded by the environmental stressors. Um, and then essentially what they're calling for, and I'll just give you some examples because the state of South Carolina has, uh, Governor McMaster has just approved an office for resilience. Um, Mr. Ben Duncan is our uh, resilience officer for the state. Um, professor at Coastal, Tom Mulliken, who's currently on a tour doing the SC7, um, the seven, well, it's more than seven sites. It's 30 days of hiking and he highlights seven sites, but he was our floodwater commissioner. And so he's highlighting the impact of uh, flood and climate change and, and, and how these beautiful places in our state need to be conserved and saved. So, um, so first they're calling for a resilience plan. And this is very much tied to infrastructure that all of the infrastructure in the United States need to be, needs to be built, rebuilt, repaired, restored with green technology. 
encouraging green manufacturing to lower fossil fuel emissions. Talks about even farming and encouraging farming um, that, uh, that uses less fossil fuels in the process. Um, encourages renewable energy. The state of South Carolina has um, really been uh, on, on, on quite, um, on, on quite a, a sort of a rise in the solar industry, um, upgrading our grids and includes even the healthcare industry that climate change is gonna cause these health impacts and we've got to create universal healthcare for people. Um, last thing I will say is that an interesting point to all of this, given um, our, our new secretary of the interior, Deb Holland, is uh, because she is a member of an indigenous community. This bill talks about the right to free prior and informed consent of indigenous peoples. That's related to International Labor Organization Law 169, which is common actually, even in constitutions around the world, not obviously in the United States. Um, and so with that, um, I'll, I'll kind of say that's the highlights of the Green New Deal. That sounds like it's really comprehensive. <laughs> I think I'm really surprised about how um, how it touches on so many different issues and that it's not just the environment. And this is, I think what we're learning is that the environment is not just about trees or the sun or water. It's literally about our livelihoods. And we often make choices about nature in light of our lives. And if, if, if a place is too hot or if a place is too cold, we try to move. And so we're making all of these adjustments, but these adjustments have a further impact on the environment. And so we, all, we have to start sort of anticipating our own actions and stop our worst <laughs> impulses, it seems like, so that we don't you know, destroy this, uh, the world in which uh, we live. Um, Mal, did you wanna add anything on to what, what Pam was talking about? Do you have anything that you wanna add about maybe some highlights or things that you like about the Green New Deal? Well, that was a thorough overview and uh, I look forward to sitting in on uh, Pam's classes. That, that was terrific. And if she had 50 minutes, she'd have gone on and, and said a number of things. So a few thoughts by way of background. Uh, 2003, the Pentagon saw climate change as a greater threat to national security than terrorism that leads to more floods, famines, fires, mass migrations, uh, it's seen as a, a catalyzer uh, toward conflict. And we saw in Syria, the worst drought in 900 years, leading to about one and a half million farmers coming into the area around Aleppo in the north, the government not stepping in, people protesting as part of the Arab Spring and leading to the, the civil war in Syria. Uh, the shortage of water in Sudan, similar problem, northern Nigeria, Yemen. Uh, the Pentagon's been aware of this. Actually, the, the Pentagon is supporting this legislation, although you'd never know it from the way it's, it's been reported. Uh, this, of course, got folded in as part of a jobs bill, which makes it more palatable because we're playing within a political context that is not new in the American experience, and I know we'll circle back to this, but it has been since 1860 that we've had one of the major parties not accept the results of an election. And I'd say culturally we're as divided as when I started college in 1968, becoming more and more polarized. Uh, it's tough for people to get access to information on this. We haven't set up our educational system where we require students to take classes on this material. Uh, high school teachers and elementary school teachers aren't well trained. So public consciousness isn't where it needs to be. And our civilization's a force of nature that threatens our security at this point. I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that this is considered uh, by people in the Pentagon who focus on security, that this is a national security issue. I guess one of my, my questions is, is that the kind of argument that will work? Um, to, so I guess my question is like, how much hope do we have of getting all everybody on board in this, in such a polarized environment? Um, 
I guess I have, that's my question. And, but then I have, a, I guess I sort of have like a little bit of a follow-up question. Um, so one of the things that I think about when, uh, what, that I think most people think about when they hear about the environment is they need to recycle or they need to use solar or they need to drive a hybrid vehicle. And I guess my first question is, are those things not enough? Or like, what are the, why aren't those things enough? And from what I understand, the answer is that me recycling or me driving a hybrid vehicle, while that's good, unless millions of other people do that, it's not going to be enough. And so that's why we need a concerted effort. So like when we, when we pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol it, or the, the Paris Accords, it was such a disaster, right? And the what rest of the world viewed it as terrible um, because we have to live in, in the same planet. And I'm wondering if y'all can just address that, the sense in which like we don't often appreciate how like our actions with the environment, you know, affect uh, in, in bigger ways and, and just this personal versus political solution. Pam, will you mention that? Maybe talk about that for just a second. Yeah, I'll just solve all those issues in two seconds. <laughs> That's a lot. Um, but let, let me just unpack some of what you said because it's, it's, it's good and it's important. Um, first things first, yes, I do have hope. And the reason I have hope is because Mal said it's a national security issue. I'll give you just a brief story. Um, I went to a conference ugh, like three, four years ago here at the National Western Research Reserve um, in Georgetown. And it was on a group of science, groups of scientists from all over the world. I think I was the only token social scientist in the group um, <clears throat> uh, to discuss ways that we could create a coastal observatory because of the severe impacts of climate change. Who attended? that conference uh, were people um, from FEMA, but also people um, from, uh, uh, from our intelligence agencies. And what they were saying is, every time we have a massive storm, it impacts so greatly um, our ability to be able to secure the coastline in particular, that we actually need more data, more concerted effort on um, uh, on security issues um, and on, on environmental. And, and they were looking at the confluence of the social impacts to the environmental. Um, so they were deeply interested in this, um, sat in and listened to everything. And we've since applied to for various grants on this um, with different agencies. So yes, I am hopeful. And I would also say I'm hopeful because, um, and this may not sound right um, to, to maybe some people listening, but I'm hopeful because there's a lot of Republicans in South Carolina who, um, unlike the national stage, understand that flooding is a real topic and, um, and, and that we, we have to react to, to the flooding and to sea level rise. Now, all of that said, um, in, in the, the research that I've been working on, I've been, I've been looking at um, ending the fossil fuel era and movements to do that, and also, um, uh, places around the world that have changed their legal and governmental structures to base them on a more ecological view. And I would say even the Green New Deal misses the mark. So that I gave you the positive and now here's the negative. If we simply as a society say the only reason for us to do this is for our national security, we've missed the mark. Um, we are embedded. We are one with nature. We don't live without water and air. And we don't live if our houses keep getting flooded. Just simply come to Habitat for Humanity in Georgetown County, where they're at the point where they're teaching people to do DIY skills because their homes still aren't repaired from 2015. So um, we, as a society, have to get to the point where we say we are nested within nature. It is a systemic issue. We have to live in harmony with our environment. And everything we do has to be built from that standpoint. So rather than building ourselves on an economy that is built on more and more and more and more extraction and um, destruction, we need to build an economy that is based on our natural resources and preserving them because in essence, we preserve our life and the, and the lives of all of the creatures on this planet on which we depend. Um, the Green New Deal, in my opinion, um, it, it misses the mark on that, but it, it, it certainly infuses that systemic um, idea. So um, 
I think we are we can come closer um, to the things that you were talking about, Jelena. So I think one of the questions um, Jelena wanted to touch on was, does the Green New Deal sufficiently uh, address the issues that we currently have? And also I wanted to add, um, I cannot remember the statistic off the top of my head. So Pam or Mal, you might know the exact figure, um, but something like 70% of the emissions come from only a handful of uh, so like a hundred different companies or something. And it's not necessarily individuals that can change the course of what's happening with our environment. Um, like plastic straws has become like a big thing in the past couple years to switch to paper straws or reusable straws. And I read that plastic straws make up like 1% of all the plastic that's in the ocean. So um, is there anything that you uh, want to say about that or what can an individual do if anything versus the legislation that will hopefully solve this crisis? Mal, you can go ahead. Well, I think uh, Pam was right. We're looking at a revolution of values. Uh, as a species, we haven't learned to live in harmony with the earth. And as a society, we're a colonial empire. We started as a colonial empire and, and we haven't let up any. Uh, and we've, uh, we've taken over and destroyed other species with an arrogance that's breathtaking. I mean, this is an existential crisis that doesn't come through because it's so depressing that people don't want to think about the implications. Uh, to come back to what Pam was saying, the, the UN studies uh, about every five years usually bring in more than a thousand scientists from over a hundred countries and they range in disciplines and each one of their estimates shows that we've been underestimating the intensity and the speed of the problems that we're facing. Uh, feedback loops like the polar ice caps melting and then more heat being absorbed in the Arctic are happening faster and faster as the ice melts. Instead of reflecting the heat, the heat's absorbed into the ocean. Or when the permafrost melts in the Arctic areas, it releases methane, which is around 24 times more potent as a greenhouse gas. This is gonna change the weather patterns. And what we're looking at is something that's really is biblical in nature. We're causing, we're reaping what we've sown. We're causing plagues on humanity. Uh, and if put in those terms, maybe the church community would come along a little bit more quickly with us. Uh, but it is so depressing that a lot of people block it out. I mean, we have a wealth that would make biblical kings jealous in the middle class. And we become addicted to materialism. And it's tough to get people to move past their addictions. So it, in this series of proposals for a Green New Deal, if we got the maximum proposals, which clearly politically we're not going to get, you know, we would be making some significant progress. And it's, it's going to take all of us in this together at a personal level, as well as government guiding research and development maybe even a carbon tax. It'll be all of the above to move fast enough in a 10 year period. None of this is politically safe. Well, let me, let me backtrack on that. Some of this is politically possible. And that's what we're seeing hammered out with this bevy of proposals between the Senate deal at $1.2 uh, trillion uh, and the House bill uh, at uh, I think 760 billion dollars. Uh, well, the Biden team wanted much more than this and wanted a human infrastructure set of policies as well, which is long overdue and the human infrastructure would take us really to where much of Northern Europe was at 50 years ago. But we're stuck in a political context and the public doesn't have access to a lot of good information, but they have been subjected to an awful lot of propaganda so that they don't recognize the, the nature of the problem. So I agree, we're looking at a revolution of values as a species to finally live in harmony with the earth. I think the proposals of the Biden team initially were a lot stronger and now it's being beaten back politically. 
uh, and we'll, we'll probably circle back to that. But those are initial comments, and I'm sure Pam will be able to broaden that in a number of, of ways. Um, Ashlyn, I just want to say thank you, Mal. Um, I do believe that individuals, um, I don't think we have a choice, as Mal just said. Individuals have to act responsibly, and here's a reason why. Before we started, Jelena mentioned her children. Well, I have two children as well. And if I don't teach my kids to act responsibly, then we have just created a whole other generation that will be wasteful, that will um, not think about their consumption and production, that will not close the, and, and create a circular economy. Um, they won't think about life cycles of items. Um, and so I think it's important that as individuals, not just as parents, but as individuals, it's, we are the sum of the whole. So um, we make that individual contribution and certainly we recognize while making that individual contribution that this is a systemic issue, that there are industries um, that, are, um, that are certainly extractivists and that are promoting extractivism around the world. Um, and also that our economy and our market is motivated by increased gains by growth. Um, it's not a steady state economy. And so um, we have to be able to create a way that people can have a sustainable economy and living and at the same time um, uh, protect our environment. So I do think individuals are important. Thank you, thank you. Good, that's good, that's good. Um, I, I'm not sure if this is a, we do have a lot of questions and I know we have one, one, a couple on the Facebook chat. Let me just ask one real quick and then we'll uh, go to the Facebook questions. Um, can you be specific? So it sounds like to me, the Green New Deal, Pam, and you said at the beginning that this is a, it's a revolution. It's a revolutionary way of thinking. Are there some specific proposals that are in the Green New Deal to, for example, regulate corporations and their, um, I don't know, their fossil fuel, uh, I don't know what, what the word for it is, production, um, or their, uh, you know, their, their, their contribution uh, to climate change. <laughs> yeah, pollution, yeah. The contribution to climate change. Like, mm -hmm. like, are there specifics that are in um, the, that are a part of the Green New Deal or, or, or is it more of like a philosophical document? Well, there's sort of specifics. There's uh, about 18 calls to action, right? And um, so let me give you some examples that relate to corporations, right? And their responsibility. So um, one of them calls to utilities, which is upgrading our grids and renewable energy. Um, and so we could, for example, look at our current utilities in the state of South Carolina, um, Duke and Dominion and Santee Cooper, um, we had a failed nuclear process and now Santee Cooper is um, sort of looking at um, closing their nuclear, or sorry, their um, coal plants and um, moving towards utility scale solar. Um, we saw what happened in Texas with regard to energy, uh, energy failure and, um, and the cost of energy because of it. Um, so update, uh, updating grids and utilities. Utilities are a huge part of this. And of course, independently owned utilities, right, are, um, are, are corporations and, uh, and traded. Um, building in efficiency to corporations so that when they act, that efficiency is um, lowering fossil fuels and moving towards net zero. I think the net zero is encouraging um, corporations to be carbon neutral. Um, clean manufacturing so that when you are manufacturing products, you're using renewable energy. We've got good examples in South Carolina of corporations. We didn't have much of an onus for clean energy. And we can look at Google and Volvo because of their global nature and the pressures on them probably primarily from the European Union, um, um, their corporate and social environmental reporting forced them when they came to South Carolina to require renewable energy. Um, investing in, um, industrial uh, um, farming policies that lower um, soil degradation and uh, lessen fossil fuels. And um, strengthening labor and labor unions is a big part of this. And of course, that is, a, um, that is something that the Republicans um, have really um, honed in on as something that they don't like. Creating a living wage 
uh, is, is another part uh, of the corporate sort of responsibility. And also there's a part in there about commercial endeavors uh, being free of unfair competition and um, eliminating monopolies. Uh, so there, but in terms of uh, climate change responsibility from corporations, no. A lot of critics have said that there's no um, carbon tax included in this or cap and trade plan included in this. And that was a criticism of, of environmentalists, uh, people in, in, that were concerned about how they were going to engage the net zero economy. So I would say um, that's, in, that's some of the, the, the deep dive details. But let me also just say that the current infrastructure bill that passed the House not long ago and is being looked at in the Senate, um, the Green New Deal uh, um, reps in the House wore green hats, right? And they said this is, a, this is sort of a, a win for the Green New Deal. Um, they called it transformative. And they um, referred to, you know, roads buckling in Oregon because of the heat and permafrost melting in Alaska, um, you know, rolling blackouts in Texas and trying, you know, to switch our economy to net zero. That clearly impacts corporations. Um, and it did give the current infrastructure bill passed in the House gives $4 billion to electric vehicle charging stations. Um, $8.3 billion for reducing carbon pollution, $6.2 billion for infrastructure resistant to weather. Um, and I've, I'm sure we probably all read in the news that that was actually gonna really impact Ori and Georgetown counties that Senator Lindsey Graham sent out a call for, um, and this is a controversial topic, I-73 expansion. That's now, is, is that really green? Um, <clears throat> so some of what can be called part of the Green New Deal, we may have to unpack. Um, but also Ori County leaders put together a list of special projects that they wanted funding for, like um, the $150 million for a Southern Evacuation Lifeline, uh, $75 million for Carolina Forest um, Highway Exchange, Highway 31 Connector, and then the least amount of money is $3 million for flood mitigation study at the Waccamaw and Petey Rivers. So um, I throw that out there, you asked for details. So if you're wondering, okay, we got this Green New Deal, the Biden administration tried with a you know, couple million dollar um, infrastructure plan. It obviously has been negotiated down to the current infrastructure bill that passed of about $715 billion in the House and is now being considered in the Senate. Um, how does that boil down to details? Well, it's boiling down to infrastructure. Yeah, I would just say that uh, if Al Gore was elected in 2000, the broad outlines of this would have been long uh, ago implemented. Uh, we're, we're a few decades behind at least. Uh, I agree with your overview. Uh, the, uh, to unpack things a little more on the electrical vehicles, we're using some rare earths. There's a lot of uh, carbon gases that are created in the process of building the batteries and then disposing of the batteries. So we're learning with these technologies, but it is huge step forward and something that we've long needed. Uh, it, it would be much larger if politically they could get more through. I mean, even the Biden team was listening to what the Sanders team was saying on this, but they don't have the votes for it. So they paired it back. Now we're into politics being the art of the possible. Um, but, but this would be uh, the largest infrastructure bill we've had in 65 years. So this, this might be uh, something to build off of and it might allow uh, Democrats to be uh, in power in the House and in the Senate in 2022 by going for a more modest package. Um, hard to tell. But, and what it sounds like you're saying though is that we're going to be able to address a lot of these environmental issues in the infrastructure bill. It sounds like maybe at least 50%, 75% of them are going to be addressed. I guess when I hear you say something like, oh, let's be carbon neutral. Like if you ask me, I'm like, I don't know how to be carbon neutral. Like, what do I do? Like, do I have a shorter shower? You know, like, so it seems like if some of these um, <coughs> proposals that are being made 
that that will bring down our carbon emissions. And I just want to say, I've been hearing about these greenhouse gas emissions since I was in sixth grade, which that I'm not going to say how long ago that was, but that was in the eighties. And um, it's shocking to me that like so little has been, has been done in that, in that time period. Um, so I'm not saying I'm not optimistic, but I, I'm saying I want to see something like this bill passed and then like, you know, action moving forward. Pam, I'll let you get started on that. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think we have seen action and um, certainly at the global level, we have the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals that were passed in 2015. It's Agenda 2030 runs through 2030 and likely beyond. It's 17 goals that focus on the social, the economic, and the environmental. Um, the entire world is reporting on it. And um, the United States has lagged behind. Um, and at Coastal, we have a regional center of expertise on education for sustainable development, which links into the UN sustainable development goals. Um, and I think this upcoming academic year, we'll be, we'll be working on that to try and demonstrate that as a, as a campus. But um, there are cities, including Columbia, South Carolina, Greenville, and Charleston in South Carolina that do voluntarily report to the UN Division for Statistics to measure the sustainable development goals. Now, is that good? Uh-huh, excellent. So we see, we, we see some momentum. Um, are there um, Ready for 100 campaign in the Sierra Club? Columbia has signed on. We have a student working on that in the fall uh, at Coastal. And um, so there are cities uh, that even though the Trump administration um, was, was not uh, globally active on climate change, nor nationally active, we know that at, that at the municipal and even county levels, uh, locally in the United States, we've been moving forward. And so um, I do see that there is, uh, there, there is momentum on that. Um, I will say though, where the momentum has lagged is something that the Green New Deal has pointed out which is um, climate change, yes, obviously, affordable housing and the vulnerable community issue. And um, I'm just gonna, Mal, you go ahead and, and talk and I'm gonna share my screen with some statistics for the viewers to see um, what we're kind of talking about here. Well, let me just build off of that to provide some context. At this point, the UN estimates are that the United States uh, is causal factor for somewhere around 15% of the greenhouse gases. China is the causal factor for somewhere around 27%. Uh, the UN, uh, I think, has done exemplary work, new in the history of humanity, to have us get together and talk about global problems. But at times, some challenges having the right hand know what the, the left hand is doing. For example, International Monetary Fund and some of its prescriptions to get developing countries out of debt uh, has required them to sell off resources. And that could be selling off timber reserves that let them uh, fall in the hands of uh, private companies that then chop down forests uh, for quick profits uh, and thus impacting greenhouse gases uh, and the, the, the lungs of the earth uh, with the forests. Uh, also with the uh, World Bank, uh, their predisposition for investing in large infrastructure projects like dams. And dams can be very effective, but they also can be major sources of greenhouse gases, sometimes 20 times more greenhouse gas uh, from a large dam uh, than you get from just producing energy from a coal-fired plant. So some of these we want to become more mindful of, uh, and the UN itself has to be uh, uh, working with uh, one direction and one voice. And sometimes those uh, large international banks aren't uh, held accountable for some of their policies the way they need to. To, to come back just for another moment about what, what Jill was getting into, I think that the notion of uh, our impact on the environment, what our carbon footprint is, takes a little while to both study and learn and then start to reflect on. Uh, along with our daily food, we probably need to think in terms of 
Am I living in harmony with the environment? And I think that's part of the revolution of values that we were, we were mentioning before. I don't know if you all can see my screen. We can, yes. We can. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, that, yep, that um, is uh, Atlantic Avenue and Surfside. Mm. And um, so just to kind of give a sense of, of, of why the Green New Deal and infrastructure issues are important to us um, uh, and impact us on a local level. And then also, um, this is uh, this is global. This is climate change downscale climate change data that we uh, had a NOAA grant for in Georgetown County. And so, I just want to uh, point out um, a couple of things here, make this larger so you can see it. But um, if you look, for example, at the average historical minimum temperature was 54 degrees, and now is moving up to almost 61, and the average um, high. Uh, average maximum was 70, uh, about 76, and is now going to be at 83. Um, summer maximums are going to move almost to 98. And um, so there, you can see a real difference. Um, you look at the extreme days uh, over 100 degrees from two degrees to, to from, from two days rather to 32 days. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, these are just some data points. If you look at the four inches in 48 hours of storms, like hello now and tomorrow, um, um, not that I don't think they're predicting four inches, but um, you see that it's almost a doubling effect there. And then you look at the sea level rise. And this, by the way, is only in this, I'm talking about in, 20, uh, in 2070. So, um, and then the next thing uh, is, <clears throat> if you look at vulnerability categories, Households with income um, below poverty levels, and you look at Georgetown, Orion, Williamsburg counties. If you look at um, households um, with 30% or more of income spent on housing, if you look at this, almost a third of the households in the three counties I mentioned. Um, if you look here at children living in concentrated areas of poverty, and, and so here, all of these, and then you compound that, for example, with um, uh, third graders below state levels in English. I mean, 76% in Williamsburg County. Math standards, 67% uh, in Williamsburg County. If you combine, and this is, I think, the point that we've been making, systemically look at the food insecurity levels or the flood prone homes in Georgetown County are 45%, 23% in Myrtle Beach, 32% uh, in Conway, 17% in Williamsburg County. Um, if you combine that, you see that Mal is right. I mean, the United Nations is not the panacea of utopia and everything perfect. Um, and what many people are criticizing these goals for is they are looking at the current sustainability model, but they're not looking at the model all the way to the right that considers first um, the planetary boundaries and then moving all the way up through the chain. Um, so in any event, um, I just wanted to kind of, I'm gonna stop sharing my, my screen here, um, but I just kind of wanna, well, let me just show this too. Um, if you look at this table on the left on um, coastal communities and their growth, and you look at 2010, look at the growth in coastal counties. And if you look here at the coastal water, at the watersheds, look at the watersheds. You can see that our South Carolina watershed is, is really important and large. If you look on the left side of the screen, you can see the wetland density um, of our state is, it, you see it's in the darker blue areas, which means we have high wetland density. And then you look on the right side of the screen and you can see the loss of freshwater and saltwater wetlands. Um, that loss is also because of infrastructure and I'll stop sh sharing my screen now. Um, that loss um, has been, and this was from a National Fish and Wildlife report, that loss has been attributed to um, suburban and urban sprawl and timber corporations. So um, that's the confluence of what we've been talking about. One thing you mentioned about um, roads expanding and things um, specific to Horry County. Um, so, you know, Palmetto Point Boulevard got that extension that I think was made to um, 
the residents on Palmetto Point believe that it was for their benefit to like get quicker to 707 and whatnot, but there is so much open space on the way that they're absolutely going to put in housing developments. So I guess, <laughs> how is that going to create more of a problem for flooding in Socasty if they're just tearing down all these trees and we have little creeks running all over the place? It kind of seems like we're, you know, shooting ourselves in the foot. And Pam, I just, I'll let you talk. That's more your <laughs> neck of the woods. Yeah, Mal's from Hartsville, so. <laughs> well, um, I had two students last semester do a report on the South Carolina Department of Transportation. They work with the Biomass Council in South Carolina. Um, and they did a report on the Department of Transportation. Many of us who have driven from anywhere in the Grand Strand to the upstate have seen that they're just clear cutting all over the highways, right? And you just, you're thinking, why? This was so great, it was so pretty. We had lots of trees and, um, and it was because uh, there was a, an argument that you know, a lot of people were running off the road, falling asleep and killing themselves uh, on a tree, um, running their cars into trees. And so we created this massive campaign to cut down the trees. Well, lo and behold, my students did a little work in Andrews, South Carolina, and they found where the rural road cutting was, um, it was also flooding. Um, and in fact, um, pines are not a protected tree, and yet pines are known to, um, in, to, to, um, to reduce flooding and, um, and intake uh, more water. Uh, and so the irony of all this is, as you mentioned, um, we have low impact development. They're called LID standards. The National Estuarine Research Reserve, the state. I mean, we have all of this. The issue is um, we also have, and thankfully so, private property rights. And um, our, our zoning and planning regulations uh, don't prohibit clear cutting um, except for within the guidelines of a tree ordinance. And sometimes those tree ordinances um, aren't as protective um, maybe as we'd like. We also um, have very little, this report that I just uh, talked about on wetlands talks about the fact that we are negligent. Um, many counties and states are negligent on protecting our wetlands. Um, and so we don't have local wetlands protection uh, very strong. It runs through the Army Corps of Engineers and then in some cases um, through the state level, through the Department um, of Health and Environmental Control. So um, will it cause flooding? I can't say for sure in Socasty, but we know Socasty has been a hot spot for flooding. Um, and um, we also know that cutting trees just exacerbates the problem. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we see other areas flooding even more now. Um, but we can uh, switch and go to the Facebook questions, Jelena, unless there's something else you wanted to kind of piggyback on. And then switch gears for a second, sure. Okay, cool. So we have three questions. Um, now the first one we'll go with, uh, these are all from Damien. So he wants to know if either one of y'all can speak about the racist history of the highway system and how the infrastructure plan would repair damage done to the black communities. Now, you wanna take that? I don't want to claim it's an area of expertise. Uh, I, I, I think decisions were made uh, without low-income communities on transportation plans. Uh, and that was part of the uh, highway bill in the 1950s, which did a number of good things, but it wasn't factoring in questions of class and race. So communities were divided. Uh, Brooklyn's, I guess, a classic case, but it happened in a number of big cities uh, where communities that were intact, all of a sudden, uh, folks are the other side of a barrier uh, and differences grew. Uh, of course, I'm from Los Angeles, where when I started teaching in a state prison in 1977, there were about 400 street gangs. So things had been out of control in, in inner city areas for a long time and a lot of needs hadn't been addressed. Some of the proposals for the Green New Deal put considerable money into environmental justice, but we're still waiting to see, are we looking at the House proposal, the Senate proposal? None of them will go far enough. And I think we, we now move into uh, questions of political power and policy. 
And if I might go off onto a, a state tangent on this, where I, I think um, folks will find it interesting, with Next Era's efforts uh, to buy out Santee Cooper because of the failed VC summer plant, we had Santee Cooper that's a cooperative, but basically it's a good old boys club, largely white, largely inefficient, coal fire plants, uh, poor on diversity, um, and finally uh, the debacle with VC summer and we're now taking a look at it because once it hits crisis stage, then people are looking at things. Next Era actually is one of the most effective, if, the, the mo if not the most effective uh, corporate entity moving into sustainable energy. They get all sorts of good ratings from environmental and business groups for being very aggressive on wind and solar. They wanted to buy but because of the politics of the system in the state, we had one of the few aggressively sustainable corporations unable to buy out a corrupt cooperative. Uh, Ashland knows that I'm passionate about cooperatives and democratic socialism. So, but I also think that we're in a crisis and we have to look at all options. So in this case, Next Era, better on diversity, better on efficiency, better on sustainability, still wasn't able to make the, the uh, sale because it was blocked by a number of state senators that were afraid of redistricting and alienating the head of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And I've heard that from a couple of senators. So I'm convinced that there, there's kind of an opaque layer of redistricting and state politics came into play when it shouldn't have. And I think that's unfortunately some of what's going on here, that, that sweet reason is unable to prevail because of politics on the ground. And we haven't done uh, our work at the grassroots level for a number of years. So we aren't able to push through basic changes like this. I know that was a bit of a digression, but a, <laughs> hopefully a useful one. No, thanks for that. Um, well, we I'd like to uh, just address your issue on um, the original question from Damien. Mm -hmm. There is in the current infrastructure bill that passed the House um, uh, uh, funding for connecting roads and bridges to uh, minority uh, and low income communities. Mm -hmm. So bridging communities as opposed to separating communities um, to ad address uh, Damien's question. and. Um, with regard to environmental justice, uh, I want to shout out to Reverend Leah Woodbury and um, Ms. Loretta Slater. They've been working hard in the Florence area, but all over really um, the world, but in particular the Southeast on these issues. And we've worked uh, together on um, solar energy issues in particular. Um, Reverend Woodbury has come to the Grand Strand and talked about the fact that um, the incentives that we have for renewable energy for individual households are tied to tax credits. And tax credits are only available um, for people who can take advantage of them. If, if, if you aren't paying taxes, which generally means if you are paying taxes um, at over the amount, um, and you can get a credit for your taxes, well, that generally means that your income is higher. And so um, low income or even a lot of retirees can't take advantage um, if, if you're in a um, sort of uh, a, a limited household budget, you can't take advantage of tax credits. And so just the financial incentive for um, addressing environmental justice for renewable energy for households isn't there. And then you couple that with the fact that then you're dependent upon a utility to get your energy. And if that utility is providing energy from coal or from fossil fuels, um, you really don't have a choice. Um, so uh, I think in the, in the case of now we know what's happening with Santee Cooper, the idea is that we advocate now um, for renewable energy and um, a state, uh, increased state portfolio for renewable energy. Thank you both, thank you. Um, so Damien's second question is specifically, well, I guess it's not really specifically for you, Pam, but it's based off of something you mentioned. So you and Mal can both kind of tackle it. But he, um, he says 
that you had touched briefly on the racial wealth gap and the gender wealth gap and wants to know how, if it does, how does the Green New Deal specifically address those issues? So the Green New Deal doesn't specifically address anything. <laughs> and I think um, it's sort of an overarching framework. And the idea was it was a resolution that was gonna be passed to be almost like Jalina said, the founding principles for all of the bills that would be passing for um, economic development, for infrastructure, et cetera. Um, so um, with regard to those, those wage gaps, what it's talking about is strengthening um, bargaining power for labor, um, number one. It's also talking about a, a living wage, number two. And it does specifically say that there shouldn't be, da shouldn't be gaps in a gender uh, and, and racial incomes. And so, um, but there, there are really no specifics uh, to the Green New Deal. Okay, well then it sounds like there's not anything to- um... yeah, I'm having a tough time with uh, the, the video. Can you still hear me? I can, I can. So the next question then is, um, is there any language in the infrastructure plan that calls for privatizing any public services? Mal, you yeah, want to take that? They call it asset recycling, and that may be part of the, the funding on this uh, for some compromise legislation. You know, they're going to do more IRS enforcement, take some money that was unspent, What we, we can still hear you, Mal. Oh, wait, maybe we have lost them. I That's... think we may have lost them. Um, um, did, did you was the question about privatizing public services? Yeah, is there anything in the infrastructure bill that is privatizing public services? Well, in the House bill, um, I think. Mal sort of addressed it, but for example, um, it could potentially be reducing carbon uh, emissions um, would have, you know, private, I mean, let me just back up and say that the economic development modus operandi for the Green New Deal is that we actually um, don't cut off, we don't cut off private industry, but we incentivize private industry, right? That's the buy-in from, from, from the other side, right? that private industry joins us in this initiative and we create new green jobs. And so um, absolutely, there's all kinds of ways that there'll be private public partnerships. There already are. Um, so um, in a multitude of ways that we could, we could talk about. And so, yes, and I think in fact, that private incentive is the job creation and job growth, but for green industry that we're talking about. And the solar industry in particular is a really good one in South Carolina, as I mentioned, it's on, um, it's really increasing. Um, any of the students from Coastal that are on the solar ambassador team that apply for jobs in solar, now this is around the United States, 100% of them get jobs and multiple offers. Um, and so, you know, I think in South Carolina, the exciting thing about that is that you don't need a college degree to get a job in, um, in, in solar installation and in solar sales. And so um, you just saw some of the statistics I showed you on education. And, and so we can actually help people get affordable incomes through green jobs. Mm. Yeah, that sounds great. Looks like we might be getting Mal back. Hey, Mal, are you- Hello back? again. Hi. I'm not sure how much of that you got. I don't know. <laughs> I'm working in equality since 1928. And uh, I, I think we're able to move uh, arguments on minimum wage from the margins to the mainstream when we organize as communities and countries. I mean, this wasn't coming from Senator Biden. It doesn't come from the mainstream media. When we supported Sanders and Warren, all of a sudden it was part of the national dialogue. When the people lead, the leaders tend to follow a bit more and it's gonna happen more from the grassroots. Yeah, I like that um, that little phrase. I've heard you use it so many times. When the people lead, the leaders will follow. So I think that gives people a lot of hope. Yeah. 
Yeah, I like that too. I think that that's definitely one of the things that that's that's happening. Um, and I think that addresses what Pam was saying about trying to incentivize uh, corporations or private private partnerships as opposed to, I don't know, either punishing or fining. And I think if if the world, if we act like we want a green world, then, you know, the corporations will follow. And as Pam gave some good examples of corporations who, who did that. Um, so one of the questions that <laughs> you often get about uh, government is, how are we going to pay for this? And so uh, I'm curious, um, we've talked about a lot of uh, infrastructure um, deals and uh, pro pro uh, proposals that have been made um, that are in the current infrastructure bills. And how, I mean, to me, like, I mean, I guess, I mean, money is always a factor, right? Money is always a factor. And I'm sure that there's long-term payoffs for doing a lot of these things, but how does the economics of, of the Green New Deal work in terms of how, how we pay for things? Mal, since you got cut off, I'll defer to you. Well, there's, there's plenty of money if we start to raise taxes on the wealthiest 1% and raise corporate taxes even partway to where they used to be. Uh, the taxes on the wealthiest 1% under the Eisenhower administration were 90%. Now it's at 35%. Sweet spot might be closer to 50 to 70%. But politically, that's a non-starter because we would be stopped uh, by Republicans and some conservative Democrats like cinema and mansion. So there's, again, we, we have to work within a political context, but you know, there would be trillions of dollars that would be raised doing that. There could be taxes on financial transactions uh, or trading of currency. This is done in a number of countries and they're able to generate a lot of money. Uh, we could also have a carbon tax. A carbon tax actually would make the public as well as corporations very sensitive to the real costs of production. But politically, it's not popular. We saw what happened in France a couple of years ago with the Yellow Vest movement, where people rose up against it and protested violently for a while. And there's a fear that politically it's a non-starter. Actually, in time of crisis, that would generate a lot of money and would cause people to think twice uh, about purchases that they make. So we could go a number of those directions, but undergirding it is people don't see this as a crisis yet. It's a problem whose salience is lower than a number of other things. And until we're able to do that political work to change the dialogue for people to see this as a need for revolutionary change, we're going to have a tougher time raising the money. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't disagree. Um, I will just say that um, I think uh, there's a lot to be said for work in ecological economics and um, the fact that our air is free. Um, the services that water provide, uh, provides us are, are free. And um, yet, if you were to get a service from a store or purchase something, you would pay for it. But uh, we are paying for our water, um, but minimally, and we're not paying for the services that that water provides us. We're not paying for the services that the trees provide us. Um, and that's not, um, people may say, well, oh, come on, Pam, get, get your head out of the clouds. That's actually the truth. That's the way the ecosystem works. We created the economy based on an approach of um, limitless growth, growth. And that's just a lie. We can't have limitless growth. Um, I mean, we know that just from our own body ecosystems, you just can't gorge yourself of food or eventually you'll get sick. Uh, so it's, it's nothing, all of this is actually really simple stuff. And um, if we were to provide clean energy to people, their bills would go down and they'd have more in their pockets to be able to um, incentivize the market system in a different way. Um, Mal, I might disagree with you on, on increasing corporate taxes. I might disagree with you um, on tax increases. I'm not opposed to tax increases, um, but I think we focus so much 
on the tax system. And we don't focus enough on the fact that if, as Ashlyn pointed out, we cut down, what is the value, the true value of the trees that we just cut down um, in, in Socasty, for example, or in the Post and Courier today in Casey, South Carolina, um, on the edge of a, a, a park in a community? What's the true value of that? They were paid, I don't know, 200 some odd thousand dollars the municipality, but the value of the clean air and the noise pollution for an entire community is valued at, at a much higher price. And so um, if we were saving people money on their energy bills, if we were lowering flooding rates so that people didn't have to, I mean, we all know how much it costs to evacuate with a family and then to have to pay to you know, fix your home after flooding um, even just clean up your yard, loss of work, loss of school, et cetera. If you looked at all of the costs um, versus all of the benefits of simply nesting ourselves with, inside of an ecosystem and limiting ourselves within the natural limits of that ecosystem, and then housing a free market economy in there that recognizes that, um, I think you would find that we would save money. The, the, problem, the, the problem in the clouds is though, we're not gonna do that. Um, we're not doing it. The current infrastructure bill is not doing it either. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a really simplistic conversation on either cap and trade or carbon tax or some other tax. Um, whereas if we actually had a whole different perspective and there are places like the Netherlands that are doing this, Donut Economics, you can read the book, um, but it's gonna be a long haul for us here. Now I'm real I think curious. it's going to be all of the above, <laughs> whatever you can get in the way of resources, because it's a crisis. And you saw my preference for a, a next era as opposed to a Santee Cooper, even though I study cooperatives and I like the idea of democratic decision making and, and non hierarchical structures. If they fail, we have to move on. I mean, I can see the government actually with R&D money moving into small scale nuclear because at this point it's crisis and we got to see what can work. So if government R&D money makes the breakthrough for wind or a different form of solar or ocean power, uh, I'm, I'm for letting the private marketplace flourish as fast as it can. Look, the fastest signals to the marketplace would be a carbon tax because it gets everyone's attention, but politically it's really tough to get through. And thus, the Democrats aren't really talking seriously about it. So I don't think it's it's command economy or free enterprise at this point. It's it's the best of bad options, whatever works to, to get us to sustainability the quickest. Great. Jelena. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's that's. <laughs> Right. Um, I'm curious about what donut economics economics is, mm -hmm. um, which Pam mentioned. Um, but yeah, I mean, what it, I, that's what I'm, I, everything I read is doomsday, doomsday, doomsday. And we've got to do something now. We needed to do something five years ago. We needed to do something 20 years ago. And like, yeah, I, do I see more hybrid cars? Yes. Do I hear that, you know, uh, you know, gas guzzlers are going to be off in 2050 and everybody's going to have high, uh, you know, miles per gallon in their cars by 2050? Yes. But I, I mean, I'd like to see, I'd like to see more than that. I have more people have solar in my community, but I don't see solar everywhere. Um, so I, I'd like to see it rushing headlong into the into the fastest things we can accomplish and Pam's actually doing the work I am I am just saying let's make it happen and Pam's actually <laughs> working to try to get Santee Cooper to be more environmentally friendly and close the coal plants and become and and to to become renewable resources so um, well let me fess up though to be real um it's not, you know, I'll do the work with the solar ambassadors and we'll put solar and we work with all the utilities to put solar on nonprofits, right? Um, and yet I'm a mom of kids that are in sports and I'm driving all over the place, um, wasting all kinds of fossil fuels and I know it. I'm an academic who travels to conferences, um, not currently, but I used to. Um, and most of my work was um, in South America and um, 
I'm not innocent and I'm not perfect. And I tell my students all the time, um, we are set up in a structure and a system that sets us up for a lot of dualities and complexities of life. And I do the absolute best I can, um, which is why I like to work with students to change things. Um, and, um, but I don't have solar on my house because I have trees around my house and I'm not a good fit for solar. Um, would I support utility scale solar for my neighborhood or community solar? 100%. So different things are gonna work for different people, right? Um, I think we, we need to be honest and upfront about that um, and also not punitive, you know? Um, so I think we are in a crisis. I don't think, I know we're in a crisis. And in fact, when I talk to our colleagues in marine science, like Till Hannabooth and Dan Abel, the things that they're seeing in marine geology and with our biodiversity um, in our marine habitats are, are more than crisis level. They're, they're really upset. Um, yet I remain hopeful because of people like you who do things like this and now, um, and I see a lot of movement. And like Jelena said, I think it's incremental and I see a lot of hope um, in, in a lot of Republican areas that, that even 10 years ago were not even using the words climate change. Our governor is currently using the word climate change um, and we have an office of resilience. I'm not saying it's perfect, um, but at least I see progress and um, I see a lot of people uh, on the ground in the Grand Strand doing a lot of things for flooding and sea level rise, stopping offshore drilling. We wasted a lot of time fighting offshore drilling when we should have spent a lot more time on the uh, BOEM lease for wind off our coast, which, our, which Paul Gaze, professor uh, in marine and wetland studies would tell you, South and North Carolina are top on the East Coast for wind energy. That is true, and I think that goes to the point where people don't tend to care about things unless it directly affect them. And I have told people who have asked questions like, what do Republicans in South Carolina care about? And I'm like, well, I can tell you about the ones on the coast. You know, They actually care about climate change and they care about flooding and they don't want drilling offshore. Like you said, there's a whole big movement to stop offshore drilling, which, um, you know, we have other things to worry about as well, but that is, you know, not necessarily the best thing to only care about something that affects you, but we have to take what you can get. And if we can work with them on certain issues, that's great. Yeah, let me say, I, I supported, in fact, work closely with the Stop Offshore Drilling on the Atlantic movement, yes. but um, I'm just saying it's unfortunate that all those smart people, um, Peg Howell, Sandra Bundy, Gothane McLaren, and yeah. Ian, and all those people, they spent inordinate amount of time, thank you to them for doing that, mm -hmm. when what we should have been spending our time on, but we couldn't, um, was wind energy, which we have massive capacity for. Yeah. I have learned so much about plastic from Gaffane. I have to just mention that. <laughs> She's fantastic. And so are all the other ladies that you mentioned. But to plastics, just um, Jelena or Ashlyn, you mentioned the straws and their small percentage, right? Uh, um, yeah. Well, what Till Hannabooth told me, uh, again, marine geologist at Coastal said that he and his graduate students were looking at microplastics and Stephanie Whitmire at Clemson um, was working with him and they were utterly shocked at plastics showing up even in small creeks. Um, and they were correlating this potentially, correlating, not calls alley, because I think they're in their initial stages um, with, you know, um, with waste, just different, companies just throwing plastics out uh, with waste. And um, also my students last semester did um, a heat map of, of litter in Georgetown County. And um, that's a really simple thing that we can fix. Mm -hmm. Just start educating people on not throwing out your garbage. Um, and, uh, you know, um, and that's most of that is plastics that's just flowing into our, our water system. So that's another thing that it doesn't even require a lot of money, you know? Um, but I, I can tell you picking up my daughter from high school, um, pulling out of the high school, my husband saw two young high school guys throw their plastic bottles out their windows right in front of the high school. That just shouldn't happen. No. Mm -mm. And that's true. Too. I was going to mention, uh, I was at a a conference that Goffinet pulled together last year. They had an expert talk about hormonal damage from microplastics. 
and uh, it was appalling. And if people knew about that, they would demand to test the impact of microplastics on fish and on human consumption. And once we got to that stage, people would be able to voluntarily say, these things are unsafe and demand regulation. So I'm hopeful as people get more educated, they're able to, to push elected officials uh, to, to take those steps. I think it's possible. We aren't training our teachers in environmental studies or environmental science. This is something they'll have to start at the elementary schools, K-12. We don't require it at the colleges. I'm hopeful. I think the consciousness is there. I see with young people, they're very concerned about inequality, race relations, and the environment. So great grounds for hope there and some directions for, for change. So Amber just uh, mentioned in the comments that a great place to start educating kids for those who are interested are the free programs available through the North Inlet Winya Bay, N-E-R-R, -R, which I don't know if that's, what's that stand for? Natural, I, I don't know. National Estrin Research Reserve. They, um, Beth uh, uh, is, um, she is their educator there and she graduated from Coastal in fact. Um, but she, they're excellent. They have wonderful programs for education including a teacher education program. There was just, just a wonderful by Dr. Regina Cipra at USC and Dr. Monica Gray at Coastal, Gullah Geechee Culture and STEM Sustaining Life on Aquaponics um, teacher education training last week. Awesome. Cool. That is awesome. Jill and I'm gonna pass it over to you if you have any last thoughts or questions. <coughs> As you thought, are you? <laughs> I'm so <sorry>. uh, <laughs> no, I think this is great. I feel very hopeful. Um, and I think that was probably uh, the intended goal was to learn and um, to realize that there are things that we um, are doing here in South Carolina and there are things that we can do. Um, so maybe I'll just ask Pam and Mal, are there any things that we can do specifically other than to not litter and to recycle and to buy a hybrid vehicle? And <laughs> which I have, I, I do recycle and yeah. I do not litter. Yeah. I haven't purchased my recycle, uh, a hybrid vehicle yet, but mm -hmm. is there legislation we can support? Are there other community programs? support. Pam, you mentioned the new office oh, 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 oh. that's um, through the for, through the uh, governor's office. Is that is resilience meant to be sort of on par with sustainability? Um, or, and then if there's any other offices or initiatives that we need to learn about here in the state of South Carolina, that'd be great. We can sort of land the Green New Deal discussion here in our in our hometown. Yes, uh, answer to all of that is yes. Um, let me first get through some terms. Sustainable, sustainable development is the global term because there are the goals for sustainable development. Sustainable development, um, if you were schooled like me, was a bad word. Um, it was coined in 1987 and it essentially meant um, just go ahead and pillage the, um, the natural resources of the lesser developed world, which is where I was for a long period of time. Um, However, the United Nations recognizes now that our development has to be based on climate change and those 17 goals I mentioned. So, um, and, and it specifically says recognizing living in harmony with nature and educating people about that. That is the sea change I think that the UN has done. And to Mal's point, he's right. The UN and the IMF has incentivized all kinds of bad things. And so have corporations. The difference is now um, that um, the IMF and the World Bank and corporations that adopted through the Global Compact these goals are now using these goals to measure giving development loans out. Okay, so that's, that is a step forward. Is it perfect? No, but it is definitely a step forward. Now, resilience is essentially, um, if, if you are sustainable, right, then you will bounce back better. And the idea of resilience is your sustainability plan plans for disaster, which we know in the Grand Strand and, and out West there we're planning for disaster. And so the idea is that you're not just sustainable at a level that's here, you're sustainable at a level that's here so that when you have a disaster, you don't just recover down here, you actually, you actually are able to move through that disaster and come back better. Um, 
that means more stringent guidelines, right? And so what can we support? 100% the Office of Resilience. It was an outgrowth of the Floodwater Commission. Um, it's not funded as I, as I understand, but I did speak to um, uh, um, uh, uh, Stephen Goldfinch and um, he's talking about you know, the, the funding mechanisms for it. There was something about the Antiquities Act and Land Conservation Act in South Carolina um, I know that Tom Mulliken was working on that and increasing, he's talking a lot about um, saving our forests and increasing land conservation. That's a really big deer deal because that land conservation also, to Damien's point, meshes with um, heirs property, helping heirs property uh, be, uh, be conserved and preserved. Um, and uh, we know that's an issue, that's a justice issue in South Carolina. So I think those are two things off the top of my head. But also, um, uh, I think that we need climate action plans. I mean, at the local level, where's our climate action plan? Where's our sustainability and resilience officer at the local level? There's a new element in the comprehensive plan. Um, every county has to have a 10 year comprehensive plan. And there's a new element that's the resilient element. What I would like to see is I would like to see the resilience element be the driving force for all of the other elements, land use, um, natural resources, et cetera, for comprehensive planning. Um, but I think we need to advocate at all levels for climate action plans. We don't have a climate action plan nationally. Um, and let me just say that a lot of other countries around the world, I'll just use um, uh, countries like Germany, countries like the Netherlands, um, they have ministries of the environment, they create climate action plans, and they also enforce the sustainable development goals and then corporations and municipalities are, are together adopting those goals and reporting on them transparently. That's the other thing I would say we need to support is accountability and transparency on these issues. Um, and, and so those are the things that um, I, I think of. That's great. Now I muted you because there was a little bit of background noise. I'm gonna unmute you or ask you to unmute. And then if you wanna chime in. <laughs> There we go. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Well, I want to support Pam when she runs for Congress. I thought that was a terrific overview. Uh, I, I want to add the basics to it. I think all of us need to read more on this complicated issue. It's interdisciplinary. It's why academics don't typically go there as much as they need to. And Naomi Klein's book, um, On Fire, is terrific. Kate Aronoff's book, uh, overheated, a terrific read, stunning. It's hard even to read it without putting it down and, uh, and just becoming totally sobered by it. Uh, and I think that that provides the framework uh, and, and some of the, uh, the motivation for all of us taking more risks in talking to other people, in reading more, in becoming politically more active. Part of this, we're going to have to play out in a political arena. Part of it is private consumption. Part of it's local and state laws. So it is, as Pam was saying, all of the above. It's complicated. So I would suggest picking up on reading the best you can. We've got the infrastructure bills being proposed. People can get engaged. Even if we don't get even a fourth of what we want this time, it will be more than we've ever had and it is something to build off of. Our political system has been broken for a long time with money in politics, with redistricting at the state level, with apportionment of senators, you know, with California having two senators and 15 states having less population than California, but having 30 senators. All this has to be overcome in a short period of time for us to deal with the crisis. So I think there are a number of different levels that people can get more involved. As you mentioned reading, I just wanna shamelessly plug my friend Aja Barber. She has a book coming out uh, in September and it is called Consumed on Colonialism, Climate Change, Consumerism and the Need for Collective Change. So I think that will be fantastic. Um, keep an eye out for that. And then whenever I get my copy, I will, you know, give you a copy too, Mel. <laughs> I think Thank you. And Pam and Jill and I, I think you both will enjoy it. 
Yeah. So thank you both for being here and for talking to us. And thank you, Jelena, for participating, even though you are under the weather. <laughs> I survived. No, this was great. This was totally worth getting out of bed for. So <laughs> thank you all. Great discussion. Thank, thank you so much. And to everyone who's watching on Facebook, if you enjoyed this, please feel free to check out our past discussions. And we have another one coming up, I think in two weeks on labor organizing in the South with my former union rep, Kayla, um, from UFCW. So that is sure to be another great discussion. This is great. Thank you for just doing this and for um, allowing me to be a part of it. And it's so nice, Mal, to, um, to finally be in the same virtual room with you. So um, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. I hope you have a great night and feel better, Jelena. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Great to join you.